Okay, I think we'll start because we only have an hour. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Mark Haywood. I'm this afternoon's facilitator of this discussion on the commercial determinants uh, of child health. Uh, I'm an editor at uh, the Daily Maverick and a health activist, and I'm very uh, pleased and privileged to uh, chair this important uh, discussion. Uh, I'm not going to waste time with a long introduction. You all know why we're here. We're here to discuss the commercial determinants of children's health. Uh, we're here because I think many of us understand that many of the diseases uh, that children uh, face are preventable diseases. And not only are they preventable diseases, but they are diseases that are sometimes the result of deliberate targeting of children by industries, by companies, by sectors of products that are harmful to health. And this is what we're going to explore uh, in the next hour between two and three o'clock. Uh, the way we're going to structure this session is that we are going to start off uh, with a session a presentation by Professor Sue Goldstein. Uh, Sue is from the South African Medical Research Council, Witt Center uh, for Health Economics and uh, Decision Science, otherwise known as Priceless. And I think many of you will know Sue. I'm going to put her bio into the uh, 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 chat. Uh, after Sue has given us an overview of the issues, we will then move into a discussion to unpack some of those issues. And uh, to help us with that, we have uh, four uh, panelists. Uh, Gilbert Shitadzi uh, from, from, from UNICEF, Anissa Vanka, uh, Professor Anissa Vanka, and Adila Maker Diederix, who will speak to different issues and aspects of uh, commercial determinants of, of, of child health. I'll introduce them properly uh, when we get to that part of the discussion. So to kick off the session, uh, I'd, I'd like to ask uh, Sue Goldstein, uh, just to make your opening presentation. Thank you very much, Sue. Great. Um, I hope I'll just put my video on to say hello to everybody and good afternoon. And then I'm going to put it off because our bandwidth is not fantastic. Um, so just let me know if it's in slideshow format. There we go. So I want to just talk about the commercial determinants of health and what we talk, what we mean by commercial determinants are behaviors and actions taken by commercial actors. Um, and that ranges from um, growers, producers, distributors, et cetera, um, that affects children's health can be positively or negatively. As you imagine, I'm going to speak mainly about the negative um, impacts. Um, I think most of us know that South Africa has a quadruple burden of disease, um, infectious diseases, largely HIV and TB, mother and child health, non-communicable diseases, and then trauma. And if you look at this graph, it's very clear that the non-communicable diseases um, is on the rise and the others are, well, some of them are staying the same, but the mother and child conditions with, with HIV, TB is dropping slightly. But, of course, NCDs start in childhood. And I just want to share this um, around obesity. This is from the World Obesity Report. There's an annual, annual increase in child obesity between 2020 and 2035 will be 8.2%, i.e. very high. And if you look at this graph, the um, yellow line shows girls and the blue line, purple, uh, turquoise line shows boys. And there's a mass of increase that's going to be happening. And currently, 13, well, in 2019, 13% 13 of ch children under five were either overweight or obese. This is extremely worrying. Other aspects of uh, commercial determinants are things like the Enboyeni tragedy. I'm sure everybody knows about that, where 21 children died in a tavern. Um, still unclear what happened in that tavern, but they should never have been there. And that there's food and alcohol marketing everywhere. Sorry, I'm just struggling to get to the next slide. Okay. Um, so 
the prevention of these diseases, in, in fact, in all four categories, relate to some major determinants. And we're talking about tobacco, alcohol, we're talking about poor nutrition, and that is obesity and particularly commercial milk, formula milk. And these are related to socioeconomic status, unhealthy environments, and what I'm going to mainly talk about is commercial power. Players are multinational tobacco and alcohol corporations. I'm not sure if everybody is aware that um, Bill Gates has shares in Heineken and the Bill Gates Foundation also has shares in Heineken. They're also manufacturers of sugary drinks and processed foods, and we'd like to dis discriminate between minimally processed and ultra-processed foods. They fossil fuel manufacturers at Big Pharma. And then there's also the trade associations and the nonprofits that have been developed and funded by the industry in order to lobby, um, to change, advocate for their um, profit. There's lobbyists, lawyers, and the advertising agencies are also involved. So the big area, the big way that they're trying to get children as customers is obviously through marketing. And that's through direct marketing and indirect marketing. So the advertising is clear, it's very obvious. Sponsorship, less obvious probably to children. But the ones that we don't really think about a lot perhaps is corporate social responsibility. So you find, um, for example, the Coca-Cola Foundation working with UNDP. Um, you find them doing all sorts of things during COVID, particularly the, they were very strong. You find voluntary pledges. So they'll say, we don't need regulation. We don't need laws because we will monitor ourselves and regulate ourselves. Um, this has been shown over the world to be ineffective. And then finally, the fake NGOs. Um, Aware.org, what the industry often says is that we don't need to do any more because we have spent money on an NGO that is going to raise awareness around the particular issue. So, for example, aware.org raises awareness about alcohol. Um, and Adela and I can talk a little bit more about aware.org later. The advertising appeals that they use for children are very clear. They use enjoyment, they use uh, characters, fun novelty, they use um, humor and emotional appeal. So the, the picture on your bottom right-hand side is a little girl who's buying a chocolate for her, her mother, spending her last penny on buying a chocolate for her mother. Just an example of the alcohol industry advertising. And, and although these are ad adverts for adults, of course, children are the ones who see them. So let's talk about one of them, one of the big groups, Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola's growth strategy is to target the lowest socioeconomic group in Africa. Just let that sink in a little bit. And they advertise, they'll tell us that we will open happiness, it's magic, et cetera, et cetera. What they don't tell us is how it violates our human rights, especially the rights of children who are too young to know that they are being manipulated. And um, my boss, Karen Hoffman, likes to talk about marketing as the vector, the equivalent of a mosquito that causes malaria. What we don't also know is that Coke is the top global plastic producer for four years running, and they share this honor for, with PepsiCo. So not only are they ruining our health, but they are also ruining our planet. And in a country that is really water scarce, and as you know, WASH is cr incredibly important for children, Coca-Cola uses more than 300 billion liters annually. The 25 liters of water are needed to make every half liter of Coke. What are some of the other um, corporate social responsibility processes? So I think, first of all, I think we must realize that the core duty of any organization or industry, and it is their fiduciary duty, is to maximize their profit. So this is not the, the industry being underhand or illegal. This is what they are trying to do for their shareholders. But they do it in a very, what we think, very underhand way. So, for example, 
the Global Fund and Heineken announced a new partnership to join forces to advance the goal of ending HIV and TB. Talked about the Coca-Cola Foundation in COVID. Pepsi has a co had COVID testing sites. And then, of course, we've got the formula um, milk industry that's been exploiting concerns about COVID, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's prolific and everywhere. And coming to Juul, Juul agreed to a huge e-cigarette settlement. Why did they agree to such a settlement? Because they didn't want any further publicity. So the agreement includes marketing strictures that prevent them from using cartoons, images of people under 35 and billboards and public transportation advertising. Unfortunately, that is in the US. We have yet to pass the bill in South Africa that will do that for our children. What are some of the non-marketing methods? So one of the important things that this audience really needs to understand is that they industry uses non-marketing methods such as creating doubt among science. So they fund a lot of research um, and this re industry funded re research creates doubt in the minds, particularly of the policymakers, not necessarily in the minds of scientists. But what happens is that the policymakers then, then um, step back from policies that might really prevent all these illnesses. So what needs to be done, um, what we need to do is we need to join together as health advocates at the highest levels, such as the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control um, did around the tobacco industry. War not yet won, by the way. It's necessary for all of us to collectively and collabor collaboratively reorder how commerce works and what the incentives for commerce are. Thank you. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Sue, Professor Sue Goldstein, for those introductory comments. Uh, thank you, too, to the now 106 people who've joined uh, this important uh, discussion. Um, can I please, before we continue, just encourage you to feel free to use the chat uh, if you want to raise any issues or chat on what we're discussing about as well as to use the Q&A. And if we have time, we will try to get the panelists uh, to answer some of the, the, the questions. If I can just say to the organizers, I'm unable to turn my video on. So <laughs> uh, that's why I can't be seen on the screen at the moment. But uh, we're moving now to the discussion. And as we have the discussion, I want us all to just keep in mind that the South African constitution, which is our supreme law, uh, in its section 28 speaks to children and children's rights. And one of the things that the South African constitution says is that the child's best interests are paramount in every issue uh, concerning the child. And that would also uh, apply to issues around child health. So the first of the panelists I wanted to speak this afternoon uh, is Gilbert Chitadzi who, as I've already said, is from UNICEF. And Gilbert is just going to say a few words uh, related to Sue's presentation about this issue of children's rights and our responsibilities and duties when it comes uh, to children. Uh, Gilbert will be followed by uh, Adila uh, Maker Diedrichs, who will speak on issues of alcohol use, uh, and then by Anissa, who will speak on smoking vaping and other forms of substance uh, uh, use. So over to you, Gilbert, and thank you. Yeah, thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Mark, uh, for for those words. And uh, thank you very much again to also to Sue for, for really laying the foundation for this uh, very important discussion, which, uh, I mean, as UNICEF, it's very important and critical that we talk about these things because they affect, at the end of the day, they affect, you know, children, the future of this country. As we are all aware that South Africa is really signatory to quite a number of, of, of these uh, global uh, instruments that seek to protect the rights of the child. One that 
I mean, comes to, to our mind that most of us are very much aware of is the, I mean, the Conventions on the Rights of the Child and also other, you know, various instruments uh, in, such as the Universal Declaration of, of, of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And, and, and these, are, these are really very critical instruments that seeks to, 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 pro, to protect, you know, the, the rights of, of the child. And, and they're, they're all often referred to as the International Bill of Human Rights. So for that, it, it is very important that as the signatory to all these, I mean, global instruments, we also seek to protect the rights of the children. As you have already alluded to, Mark, these rights are also enshrined in our constitutions. The very same chapters that you have, you have, you have quoted in, the, in, in our constitutions, they give us really that, you know, uh, 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 um, springboard for us to be able to, to hold, I mean, the, the, the right holders, you know, accountable to ensuring that, you know, our children are protected from all forms of exploitation and from all forms of harm. That really, that is really very detrimental to their well-being and their, their, their and, and their development. So, as UNICEF and also together with other, you know, UN agencies in South Africa, it is really, you know, our 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 call and always really our mandate to always ensure that you know we advocate for these rights that you know the South African government has has, has really as as signed as signed into. So. From 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 where, where I come from, from UNICEF side, more especially from from the nutrition side, these are the very same instruments that we, we really need to use to ensure that you know our children are protected from all forms of malnutrition. You have seen also in the slides that as Sue has presented, you know, the increase in, on childhood overweight and obesity, and uh, this is really worrisome for the future. Of this of, of 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 the South African children, so I, I, I thank thank you very much. I'll stop here for now. Thank you, Gilbert, uh, for for framing it so clearly. Um, yeah, and I would just add uh, something to what you said about the Constitution, which is what's unusual about what the Constitution says when it comes to children's rights is that they are immediately realizable, meaning that the government doesn't have excuses like it doesn't have enough resources or it uh, can only approach children's rights progressively. These duties are immediate. We should be doing everything possible. And so when it comes to basic healthcare services, which is a right for children, basic healthcare services includes preventative healthcare services and measures that government should take to regulate and to protect child health. So I just wanted to, to add that. Uh, as we move on to to unpacking uh, further some of the things that uh, uh, Sue presented, and I, I, I want to start on this question of a of 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 alcohol access to alcohol, alcohol abuse, alcohol regulation, uh, and I'm going to ask Adila to speak. And 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 as Adila comes on, I just want to relay a shocking fact. I uh, attended a national children's dialogue by the Nelson Mandela Children's uh, Foundation a few weeks ago. And the minute Deputy Minister of Social Development reported that the youngest child in a government rehabilitation center for substance use or substance abuse is three years old. So that's the scale of the problem that we are facing up to. Adila, would you like to come on and talk to this issue of alcohol harm and what we should be doing to bring about solutions to alcohol use? Adila, if you're there. I'm not sure if you're struggling with sound or if we've lost you. Okay, I did notice that Adila seemed to be sitting in a car earlier on. So uh, I'm going to move on and ask uh, Anissa uh, 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 Vanka to now, Professor Anissa Vanka to speak about this issue of smoking, uh, vaping and related harms. Uh, Anissa, welcome and thank you for being with us this afternoon. Your bio is in the chat for anybody, for those people who are interested. Thanks, Anissa. Thanks, Mark, and thanks for to stop and, the, and for the opportunity to be part of this panel. And I think this is such a vital issue. Um, I think just thinking about tobacco smoking and, and the harms the uh, to tobacco smoke have long, 
long been recognized. Sue highlighted it in her presentation. And interestingly, 2023 marks 20 years since South Africa actually signed the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. And globally, South Africa is recognized as having some of the really stringent legislation against tobacco smoking and, and control um, with strict laws against marketing. But is that enough? I'm not sure. We still faced with a high prevalence of, of tobacco smoking, uh, particularly an exposure to vulnerable groups. So potentially underreported smoking and pregnancy is still high, and there is exposure to to babies, even from the early life antenatal period um, into early life. So I think we still have work to do despite these strong um, legislation that we have. And um, But besides tobacco smoking, we now face this new threat and potentially a new epidemic through electronic nicotine delivery systems, um, known also as vaping or jewel or whatever you want to call it. And the problem with this is that it is marketed at young people. Um, this is one of those major issues where it is sold as an attractive device, it targets youngsters on social media, and the legislation around it is still not. Um, although the age limit to purchase these electric nicotine device systems is around 18 years of is 18 years of age, it's freely available. You can go to shopping centers, you can go to garages, and there's counters available selling these products. And that just makes it much more accessible to, to young people. And while we talk about tobacco, we, we have to recognize the impact of nicotine. Nicotine as an addictive drug, the effects of nicotine on the developing brain is really dire. And often we think of developing in young children, but remember the brain is developing into adolescence, despite what teenagers and adolescents Anissa, we seem to have lost you. Evidence that nicotine delivery systems are a gateway to other drugs, to other um, to smoking. And I think problematically, and one of the issues is that it's often marketed as a smoking cessation tool. And unless it's used in prescribed and used correctly under close supervision with other smoking cessation interventions, it shouldn't be seen as the only um, option. So I think just to, to sort of sum up and to end off to, to say that uh, in South Africa, we have been waiting for the updated control of tobacco products and electronic delivery systems bill that was first promulgated in around 2018. We've made some comments on that. And recently, again, in 2023, we've, we've had the opportunity to provide some comments on the bill uh, through advocacy groups, through child through pediatric departments. Um, but Tony Westwood has been really key in getting this uh, awareness around this. And hopefully with the new bill, we can have the, uh, the electronic nicotine de delivery systems will be treated in the same way as tobacco so that the same rules apply. Um, and that hopefully will also help protect uh, young children in this. I think just to, from a clinical point of view, well, you may not be aware that vaping electronic nicotine delivery systems have long-term consequences, health consequences that we may not be aware of, not just from direct um, inhaling or smoking of vape products, but even from exposure, so people present with bizarre respiratory symptoms that can't be explained by other, um, by other causes. So, so just to be aware of it as, as a clinician. Um, and then hopefully we can talk a little bit later about how we can be a bit more active and what we can do as, as clinicians to, to address this. I think I'll leave it at that, Mark. Thank you, Anissa. We are indeed going to come back to this very question of how different sectors can be more active and the role of clinicians, the role of NGOs, and so on. I see Adila's back, but just before I move on to her, can I just ask you whether you have anything to say? Uh, come back, Anissa. On the, on the issue of cannabis. I mean, you've talked about vaping as a new epidemic. You use that word, and I'm sure you used it intentionally. But yesterday, yeah. when we were preparing for this panel, you also flagged uh, uh, the issue of, of, of recreational and in inverted commas use of cannabis. I think it's relevant here if you just have, if you want to spend just two minutes flagging this as an issue uh, for this panel. Yes. 
Sure. I mean, I think that the new uh, regulations that that say that that it can be used for for um, recreational purposes brings a whole new set of issues with it, um, and and definitely something that we need to consider the accessibility of of cannabis again as a potentially addictive substance to young young people, and um, that you brought up that a child is being rehabilitated at the age of three years for alcohol, there is a potential that this that there are um, similar um, things that we need to look out for with cannabis. So I think um, that legislation also would need um, some unpacking and, and, and discussion and not to be forgotten. Yeah. Absolutely. And the informed inputs of the health, pro of health professionals into whatever decisions are taken. Uh -huh. Thank you so much, Anissa. Uh, now moving on to Adila. Welcome back, Adila. Uh, we lost you for a few minutes. Um, you're going to just unpack this issue of uh, alcohol uh, use amongst children, targeting of children, and particularly what we should be doing that we're not doing, what we could be doing that we're not doing. Thanks, Adila. Oh. <laughs> Adila, we cannot see you. I'm not sure if you are muted or we are. Oh, you're back. Yes. Adila's in, in Sarankur on uh, in the field at the moment, which is possibly why she's not um, able to connect properly. But I'm I'm happy to jump in for yeah. her because I also am involved with SARPA South Africa. So Mark. Um, just to start on how alcohol affects children, I mean, we all know, I don't think there's a, a person in this room who doesn't know about the harmful effects of alcohol. Um, we all knew what happened during COVID when it was banned, the um, emergency and trauma rooms were empty. Um, and, and of course, that impacts on children. Children get neglected, they get beaten, they get raped, et cetera, et cetera. But I think what people are maybe less aware of is that there is a um, a a soft ban by the industry on alcohol advertising. So they are not supposed to advertise to children. However, um, this is, and this is one of the voluntary pledges that I mentioned earlier. Um, it doesn't work. Um, just a cursory couple of days on television will show you that there are alcohol ads being flouted to children. Um, the important thing about alcohol, the other thing that shocked us in this last year was the um, intention of the Department of Education to sell alcohol at schools. They talked about um, the parent bodies being able to sell alcohol at schools, and um, this was part of the Bella Bill, and there was a national outrage, and people, it was taken out of the bill, thank goodness. Um, I think what we also don't realize is that the alcohol industry has managed to stop the Liquor Amendment Bill, which has a lot of um, a lot of aspects to it which will control alcohol. So decreasing access, increasing taxes, um, trying to make sure that alcohol is not sold near schools and so on. And this has been on the table in Parliament since 2017 and has never been implemented or, or even passed. And we believe that this is a direct result of industry interference. I think um, just the last thing I wanted to mention was the... Um, there is a new uh, policy that has been developed by the Department of Social Development, which is pretty progressive. And um, unfortunately, it's out at the moment and they need comment by this Friday. But we will share a link for everybody. It would be great if everybody would take the time to comment on the link. We'll share a template that will make it easier for you, for you to comment. Just to support the Department of Social Development because the industry are gearing up to oppose this particular policy. And then lastly, I just want to talk about aware.org. Aware.org is a government uh, industry funded organization that focuses on two things. And the reason that it focuses on these two things is because it doesn't in interfere with the bottom line of industry. So the first thing it fo focuses on is fetal alcohol syndrome, which if everybody knows the stats, there are just over a million women who are pregnant each year. Very few of those drink. So stopping pregnant women drink um, is, is not difficult. But what they don't do is focus on young girls who are possibly could get pregnant or young women so that we should be looking at all young women 
um, not drinking in excess. The second one is they focus on on drinking and driving. And I mean, that's a really easy one because what they don't do is they don't discourage drinking or, or moderation in drinking. They just discourage drinking and driving. So they actually encourage other people to drink and just have a designated driver. And I will stop there. Thank you very much, Sue. Um, so, so in a sense, if I'm understanding you correctly, you know, in your opening presentation, you you talked about this is the way these companies have to work to maximize profit. Um, but what you are reporting to us is that this is more than just benign profit making, that there's actual industry interference to uh, sabotage uh, public health regulations that aim to limit access to young people and so on. Is, is that what you're, you are saying? And could you also just, you didn't mention it now, but it was mentioned yesterday, I understand there's now lobbying by the Beer Association, and perhaps it's an example of what I'm saying, that uh, that beer should be uh, sold at retail supermarkets. Um, so they, they're trying to make it even more accessible uh, to people. And the, the last question I would just ask you is, is there any data on the prevalence of alcohol use amongst children uh, uh, and 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 its harm? Or is that something that we should be also looking at improving uh, uh, surveillance and collection of that type of information. Yeah, thanks, Mark. So, so in terms of um, industry industry lobbying, and it it is sort of part of their main mandate. What they do is they use every trick in the book to persuade government not to control um, the industry. So to to make sure that the um, that the bills or the or the policies that would control alcohol or tobacco um, are not implemented or or even passed, and and I'm sure that um, Anissa can talk about the the um, there's a new document that's just released a global document which talks about industry interference in tobacco, and it's 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 a very interesting document. It's very it's extensive the industry interference in tobacco policy. In terms of the beers in supermarkets, yes, they, they are running it as a campaign as well. So they're actually trying to collect signatures of people to um, sell beers in supermarkets. And we are concerned as SARPA about this because uh, it just increases availability. And any increase in availability goes contrary to the WHO recommendations, which is to decrease availability. So we are also, SARPA is also running a counter um, campaign to try and stop this happening. Um, and then, sorry, Mark, I forgot the, the third one. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. No, I've, I've... Thank you for, for that, that, Sue. Can I just remind people who are with us in the audience, feel free to use the chat. Uh, also, feel free to write questions in the Q and A, uh, and we'll ask the panelists to address questions to the best of their ability. I'm going to move back to Anisa now and and slightly shift Sue. Yes. Sorry, I remembered what it was. It was the yeah. um, prevalence of of alcohol oh, yes, of misuse yeah. amongst youth. Um, we I don't I haven't seen statistics on this. Uh, I haven't seen a recent survey. But what we do know about alcohol misuse in South Africa, which is also frightening, is that more than half of South Africans do not drink at all. So the alcohol consumption, which is very high, is, is really happening amongst uh, less than half of South Africans and in a very harmful way. Um, and I think that that has, uh, of course, children and, and youth are following that in that particular way of using alcohol. And the evidence shows is clearly connected to violence generally and gender-based violence in particular. Am I am I right? Yes. Th thanks, Sue. Uh, uh, frightening. Anissa, uh, can you just kick us off talking about what you think are the roles that different sectors should be playing in addressing these type of, of, of problems? You might also... If you want, just reflect on, Sue mentioned a report on interference by the tobacco industry, I think, in attempts to regulate uh, tobacco control. 
but mainly I'd like you to just talk on behalf of clinicians on how you think people should be stepping up uh, to address these commercial determinants of child ill health, let's call it, rather than health. Anissa. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that it's, it's a huge uh, role and a, and a big question. I think starting with with things, practical things, things like knowing the, the the legislation and supporting it, looking for for ways to to uh, address the law and to implement it. Um, and I think there's so many misconceptions, particularly around e-cigarettes um, and and the benefits. I think firstly for for clinicians, probably to align their own views and and know the 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 harms and and then work from there is probably one of the first steps. Um, and then I think it's time to also speak frankly about it. Um, speak speak frankly to to young people and to to teenagers uh, when you see them in places like your your clinics and and when it, I mean sh recent data shows that up to about ten percent of children with asthmatic uh, or adolescents with asthma are still smoking, and yet they are and they are exposed to to tobacco smokes. I mean that's high. That's a that's a individual personal level health intervention that that can take place, and that there's potentially a role for the um for a clinician to be part of, or for a healthcare practitioner to be to be part of. So I I, I think it's it's time to to also see adolescents on their own, speak to them um, in the clinical sector, in the in the in your clinics, and and just be frank about it. Um, I'm not sure it works. We 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 know very well that it's it's hard. Young people have their own minds and their own uh, belief systems, and to actually engage and to to get past that is is challenging. Um, I I think as a, a group we need to really look at effective smoking cessation. Um, support and, and policies and ways of doing it in an acceptable manner. And that is the challenge uh, in the public health sector. This is something that I think there's a dire need for. Um, it can't be held at one tertiary center. So in the Western Cape, I think Curtis Gear Hospital is the only place that has a, a smoking cessation clinic. So we need to look at supporting smoking cessation um, mm. at a really primary health care level so that it's accessible to, to many people. Um, and I think potentially that speaking to harms from early life is, is a way of, of maybe making a difference. And maybe people are not aware of that many of these impacts happen already while the baby or while the fetus is in utero. And, and, and potentially that is the place to, to look at. So preconception, look at mothers, pregnant mothers or young women um, in addressing some of these issues. Then as a body of healthcare workers, I think we really need to be uh, to lobby around these issues uh, to support things like the bill, to support both the tobacco industry bills and the alcohol bills that uh, Sue spoke about. Um, because there's pressure, the tobacco industry is sneaky. They provide, they do, they set up um, groups. They provide uh, grants, educational grants that look like they're supporting uh, health research when, in fact, they it comes from from tobacco uh, industry and money. And so, I think that there needs to be an awareness uh, that these things happen and and how we can uh, um, target it. Yeah, I think that that's my bit for now. Thanks, Anissa. I mean, there's a, a, a drum that Sue Goldstein always bangs about health promotion and the lack of health promotion and inadequacy and the fact that we have a National Health Commission that uh, has actually been gazetted and should have powers to intervene in these type of areas, but where nothing has ever been done uh, on this. And maybe Sue and Gilbert might want to reflect. You might want to come back on this as well. Can I just ask you one question before we move on from you. I've, I'm aware of projects around smoking cessation, cessation and uh, substance use that involve medical treatment as well. I know, for example, of the Sahara project in uh, George in the Western Cape that is being uh, pioneered by Dr. Hermann Reuter, who worked on HIV in the very, very early days. Is that something that we, I mean, are you aware of it? And are these interventions, I, I believe they're, they're cost effective, that they could be applied on a much wider basis, but there just seems to be very little political will 
is that something that you would endorse and support and something that the profession should learn more about and engage with? I think so. I mean, I don't know that project in particular, but I will. I will definitely look into it. But I think that 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 is that is the key thing. That as as if they are clearly set up and and well managed programs that can include medical uh, interventions, then that absolutely is the way that we need to start looking. But there needs to be political buy-in, and there needs to be infrastructure, and there needs to be accessibility um, for the communities that need it the most. Um, and I think that's where the challenge lies. Um, we we know the facts, but how do we translate it into meaningful and um, solutions? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll happily send and share with the conference uh, details uh, <laughs> about that project because I think it's very very important, and uh, uh, they're doing groundbreaking work and getting ground groundbreaking results as well. I have to declare that I'm on their board of directors. So, uh, but it's in the interests of of health promotion that I I, I mention these points. Uh, Gilbert, uh, speaking for UNICEF, speaking speaking for the you know international health community. Uh, what should what can you do more? What should what what do you think we should be doing, and what should you be doing as UNICEF? Yeah, uh, um, um, Mark. Uh, first of all, we know that I mean, government and society really have a moral responsibility to act on behalf of the child and to reduce any form of harm. This includes, you know, all forms of malnutrition and also you know, overweight and obesity. So really from our side, it's really to, to continue with our advocacy work in various areas, be it in health, um, nutrition, or in, in, or in, 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 in other area, areas that we, 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 we support, education, social, social services, and social development. It's really for us to continue with our advocacy work to really always, you know, um, work with various stakeholders, be it the civil society and uh, in an NGO NGOs uh, uh, and, 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 uh, and other and other stakeholders that are critical to this to, to, to this work, including you know the academia. We know that you know you also have academia that also works very closely with the industry. So I think it's something that we always need to conscientize. Some of them maybe do it do it maybe being unaware that may, may, whatever you know the, the source of funding they may be receiving may, may, may be from 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 the industry, so we need to work with 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 really all the stakeholders and mobilize various stakeholders in ensuring that you know we we support various efforts that you know I think government is also taking, more especially in the space that we 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 we, we work in in terms of really the regulatory you know initiatives that government is taking to really support. And ensure that you know uh, we try by all means to to minimize or eliminate, if if it's possible, really the industry interference in all the, 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 the in all our regulatory frameworks, so that our regulatory frameworks can protect the South African public, more especially you know the children of this country. So we need to continue, I mean, with our with our efforts in terms of our advocacy work. And also supporting various initiatives, which we, all, we, 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 we always do, be it in a form of evidence generation, be it in the form of reading. I mean, you know, also sharing with, you know, with, uh, with, 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 with our government best practices from other countries that, you know, South Africa can implement and, and scale to protect and, you know, the, the interest of our, of, of, of our children. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gilbert. Um, one of the problems we have with industry interference is they don't tell us they're interfering uh, a lot of the time. And it's important that there's much more openness about processes, about conflicts of interests uh, 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 by companies, by individuals who may be part on boards of companies, uh, at the same time part of academia. Again, it's an issue that, that we need to look at uh, much more closely. Um, Sue, I'm going to move back to you to talk about uh, uh, what can be done, what different sectors uh, can be done. You are from academia. Academia wields a lot of clout. And, and will you also talk, Sue, to this issue of health promotion? And I see that there's a question from uh, Mamusa Sapiri, which I think is relevant to you. I'm a dietitian based in the Northern Cape. 
We've seen abuse of home-brewed traditional beer in some of the communities as a result of this. A lot of malnourished children due to neglect by parents. Home-brewed traditional uh, is also a serious concern because how does one regulate? And, and, and maybe Sue reflect also on the fact that, am I right in thinking that one of the problems that we have is that, that, that health literacy is very low in all communities, yeah. that there's very poor understanding of alcohol harm, tobacco harm, other substance harm. And you know what, what, what do we do about that? Because I think if more people understood the harm that they were allowing their children to be exposed to, or if children understood the harm that they risk if they embark on smoking or something, that that would also assist in these, in these efforts. So back over to you, Sue. Okay, well, thanks. I think you've, you've stolen my thunder. I think that the big area in, in academia, <laughs> it's fine. The big area in academia is, is to declare conflicts of interest um, and to act on, so to not have conflicts of interest. I think that is a huge, huge area um, and a lot of research. When you read an article that um, tells you anything, you need to know who paid for that research. Um, and unfortunately, moving into the climate era, we also need to understand if fossil fuel people are funding research. And my university has just had a huge um, injection of funding from rainbow minerals. So um, it's 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 difficult because the, it, you kind of get held over a barrel. You you're not allowed to publish various things that are critical of the people who are paying for the for the research. I think what's important is to expose the industry and to make, be very clear of what is happening. And I think there's been a lot of um, research looking at the playbook, what we call the industry playbook, and understanding, particularly starting with the tobacco industry, but moving through how the tobacco industry influences the alcohol industry, how people who are on boards of these harmful industries end up as politicians, how politicians who are in high places end up on boards in these industries. So we've got lots of examples of that in South Africa, including our own president. Um, I think in terms of homebrew, I don't have an easy answer for that. But I imagine that in many places, homebrew is still being sold by somebody. And those people are, are in a way, the industry. And, and I think that communities often don't understand their own power in, in controlling what happens in their communities. Um, and I think that a little bit, as Mark says, a little bit of... of of um, engagement with people and providing a little bit of funding for communities to organize themselves um, can go a very long way to controlling things like um, the uh, abuse of traditional beer. I think for me, the, the final thing I just want to talk about is the is health promotion and, and funding. And, and one of the things as a board of um, South African Alcohol Policy Alliance, the organization, it's a tiny organization and it's very underfunded. And I think um, what would help a lot um, in many of these cases is to, to actually tax the industry more and, and use some of that tax for health promotion. So building health literacy throughout the population, making sure that sponsorship of sports is sponsored by maybe the Health Promotion Foundation or some equivalent. Uh, making sure that when we when we don't want the advertising industry to crash, that they're spending a lot of time and money on healthy advertising, um, good communication. So I think there's this this is this is not a new idea. This has been happening in Australia for years. It's been happening in Thailand, Malaysia, um, and I think that we really need to be pushing as health advocates for this kind of funding for health promotion because at the moment even if you look at HIV and AIDS uh, when was the last time you saw an ad for condoms when was the last time you tried to get condoms in a public toilet uh, all those things are standing empty uh, we've just we've just stopped doing promotion of of the easiest and most effective prevention of HIV so for me, that's that's where we should be. We, th we should be thinking. Our heads should be going towards towards that. Is is getting the polluters to pay the people who who are making a lot of money out of the harmful industry, and using that money for good. Thanks. Thank you, Sue. I know we're running out of time, but I want to ask you one other question. 
uh, because we haven't touched on it, but it is very relevant to this discussion. We haven't talked about sugar uh, and we haven't talked about uh, sugar as a commercial uh, determinant of ill health. Uh, and yet sugar is an area where, you know, a sugar tax, what we call the health promotion levy has been under this kind of sustained assaults where proposals for uh, better labeling of foods, uh, front of package labeling of foods are being uh, also interfered with uh, and potentially undermined and slowed down. Can you just say a little bit about this aspect? I'm afraid it'll have to be very quick, but I think it's important that we oh. we understand the full gamut of threats to child health. Yeah, so, so sugary beverages, we all know that the carbonated sugary beverages like Coca-Cola have absolutely no nutrition value whatsoever and cause obesity. We, it, there's a very, very strong link. What um, is less known, of course, is the uh, sugar content of fruit juices, which is not included in the sugary beverage tax. But the sugary beverage tax was into the uh, HPL was introduced in 2018 at a level way lower than was recommended. And the idea was that uh, the industry jumped in and said, no, you can't do this. We'll, we'll lose a whole lot of jobs. The problem is the industry says things like that, government responds and worries, of course, about losing jobs, but there is no evidence that this is the case. Uh, and in South Africa, the sugar industry has been under fire for decades because they've stolen money, they've bought land, they haven't followed the National Sugar Plan, which is to, to actually convert sugar to, to energy, to using sugar for fuel. So... But we all know that this particular sugar is really contributing to childhood obesity. And um, we all need to be behind the sugary beverage tax. Front of pack labeling is also important. It helps people to make choices that are a little bit more informed. So the front of pack labels that are being proposed by the government at the moment are high in fat, high in sugar, high in salt, and non-nutrient sweeteners. And those will be prominently displayed on the front of ultra-processed foods. Thank you, Sue. And as uh, Baljeet has just pointed out uh, in the chat, uh, no added sugar usually means aspartame or yeah. other sweeteners, which are also harmful. Very little understanding of these amongst the population. I've seen that uh, some of the evidence on that as well. So it's also something that we need to flag. So we're almost time up. Uh, I hope that everybody has found this session helpful. Uh, and informative and, and, and alarming. Uh, I think our panelists may have sounded very uh, outspoken uh, and uh, have strong views uh, on all of these questions. But the bottom line is that uh, the lack of regulation and control on all of these issues is a harm to children, uh, is a cause of morbidity, is a cause of mortality as well. Uh, and that it is the health profession and the health system uh, that picks up the cost uh, of care uh, as a result of preventable diseases. So I want to finish just on that point, go back to each of our panelists and give them uh, two minutes uh, each, or not even two minutes, because we've got to be out of here by 2.59, and it's 2.54 now. But, you know, next year, 2024, is a general election and all the political parties are vying for our votes. And I hope that we are all going to vote because it's our democratic responsibility, but it's an also an opportunity to put these issues on the table squarely uh, before the population, before the politicians. So starting with uh, uh, Anissa, then going back to Sue and finishing with Gilbert uh, with one and a half minutes each, what would you say uh, are the critical interventions. If you were given 30 seconds with the president now and told, what must I do? Uh, sorry to put you on the spot like this. What would you advise? Uh, Anissa? I had an unstable connection. Just repeat that last bit, uh, Mark. The, the, what Just would I advise? Very, very <laughs> quickly, what your advice would be to the president to political parties going into the 2024 election about what they sh what should be their absolute priority to try to uh, limit the harm from uh, what we've been talking about this afternoon. Right. Um, yes, <laughs> well, you have put us on the spot, but I think if you could say to Mr. <laughs> Mr. to the political parties, I would like to see 
uh, stringent control, health promotion, and and resources towards dealing with these issues. You saying it and then not and not putting resources towards practical uh, interventions and public health programs that can that can that are accessible. I, I keep coming back, accessible to communities and and acceptable to communities. It's no use uh, coming up mm -hmm. with with um, you know fancy ideas that that are not practical towards uh, at a grassroots level. So I, I think that for me is is key. Um, in terms of of substances like tobacco and uh, vaping you. and cannabis, fantastic. Yeah. fantastic answer. Accessible, acceptable, and with resources behind them. Sue. Yes, I mean I think it's almost the same. It's to pass the outstanding bills that will control alcohol, sugar. Make sure that the taxes are adequate, and make sure that there is some independent body like a health promotion foundation that can develop and engage with communities in order to make health promotion accessible and um, and acceptable and put money into that because where the money should be going is into communities to enable them to make their own choices. Thank you very much, Sue. Succinct so Gilbert. Thank you very much, Mark. I think the effective implementation of regulatory actions that protect, promote, and support healthy diets and contribute to the prevention of, of childhood overweight and obesity and other aspects that were spoken about, like alcohol, to really, I mean, respect and protect and fulfill the rights of the child is very, very critical. And uh, I mean, there are various, I mean, regulatory actions that government can take. For example, the the, 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 the the recommendation on the marketing of foods and non-alcoholic beverages to children. So we need to ensure that, you know, we put a stop to to, to that. It, there has to be very clear regulatory framework in place to, to really regulate how industry market and promote foods and non-alcoholic you know, beverages to, to, to children. Front of pet labeling that Sue has also alluded to, these are really very, very important, I mean, supportive regulatory actions that government can take. Fiscal measures, strengthening those, and also, I mean, I mean, regulating food in schools, because we know that schools have really become the, the, the you know, the, 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 the playground for the food industry, for any industry that really wants to promote its, its own products, because they know that they're grooming the future customer, which is, you know, the, our children. Exactly. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Gilbert. Thank you to all three panelists, uh, Anissa, Gilbert, Sue. Uh, you were very helpful and informative and evidence-based. Thank you to everybody who's been with us. Uh, the next session, which starts in one minute, uh, is on uh, the climate crisis and child health, I believe. And I think it's a very, very important session. for. So for those of you who are able to stay, you are strongly encouraged uh, to do so and you're strongly encouraged to act on the issues that we have been discussing this afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, everybody. That's the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, it's wonderful to be with you Thank here you. today. I'm just checking that you can hear me. I can hear you, Laurie. Thank you. Great, and you can see me. Um, uh, yeah, brilliant. That's fantastic. Um, so I'm really excited to be introducing our panel discuss discussion on climate change and child health. It's It's been certainly an issue of concern for me and I think many in this room um, for several years. And it's the first time that we're really putting climate change and the climate crisis on the agenda for the Child Health Priorities Conference. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome our three panelists, um, adjunct professor Ashraf Kuvadia, who's the head of the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health at the University of Advertisrant. Um, we're particularly pleased to have Yola Mohohwana. Um, she's a spokesperson and young climate activist um, working with the African Climate Alliance. She's also an applicant in the Cancel Coal Court case um, and also involved in the global movement 
of young people um, tackling the climate crisis head on. And then last but not least, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Andrea Rother, um, who is the head of the Environmental Health Division at the School of Public Health at the University of Cape Town. Um, and Andrea is going to kickstart today's session um, with a presentation. She's going to share with you um, the projections um, and potential impact or projected impact of climate change um, on South Africa, um, what that means in practical terms, in terms of children's health, um, and understanding their particular sensitivities and vulnerabilities. And then we're going to move into a panel discussion, really um, looking forward to solutions. What is it that we can be doing as clinicians, as child health advocates, as children, as parents, as members of our community, and as citizens, both of South Africa and the world. Um, so handing over to Andrea, and if you'd like to take the lead and share your slides. We look forward to hearing from you. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Laurie, for that. And hello to everyone. Um, I seem to be struggling to finding my slides, a uh, problem of having multi screens. Uh, can you tell me if you can see my slides or are you seeing my WhatsApp messages? Seeing your WhatsApp messages for the moment. Okay, yeah, that seems to be a problem. Um, I'm not quite sure why. Um, Maybe unplug your uh, your second screen. Yeah, I can't, unfortunately. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll completely disappear. Um, let me just try this again. My apologies. I worked perfectly yesterday, so I'm not quite sure why why there's a problem with it. Now. Um, Oh dear, <laughs> I always get frustrated when I see other people having these challenges and now it's my turn, my apologies. You're also welcome to email them through to me if, if needs be. So we can Are you seeing that. the presentation now or are you seeing a protea? I'm, I'm, we're seeing the protea, <laughs> which is a, an appropriate image in some ways. <laughs> Okay, um, I think this doesn't seem like it's going to work. Um, I'm not quite sure why. Uh -uh. So perhaps send send your slides to me, and then I have something I would really like to share myself. Yeah. Um, I think go ahead. That's if I can get my screen to share things properly. Um, what's really interesting is at the moment. Um, struggling almost as much as you are, hold on. Um, at the moment, we, we're obviously, that we're seeing a global gathering of thought leaders from around the world um, with a lot of vested interests, um, trying to put climate change on the agenda and look towards solutions. Um, and two days ago, we were focusing on health um, as a critical piece of that puzzle. Um, and what's been really exciting to see is a call to action from um, health activists around the world calling for a prescription um, for climate change. Um, and I'm just wondering why I'm struggling to see things as much as Andrea. There we go. Thank you, Andrea. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I will share that video um, after Andrea's finished her presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, my um, sincere apologies. I'm not sure why that happened. Uh, so basically, um, Laurie has already indicated how we're going to run this session. But the note I wanted to make is that, you know, I'm going to touch briefly on a lot of issues. And so it would be really nice is as I'm going through the presentation, if you have any questions uh, or things that you would like more information on, that you just put it in the chat and either we'll pick it up um, during the discussion uh, or respond to you uh, in the chat. So really what we wanted to do with this session is to put 
children at the center of our thinking around what's happening. I mean, we talk about climate change, we talk about global warming uh, and uh, the sort of El Nino, what's going on and how do we actually then prepare for the impact that it's gonna have on children and children in the future. But just briefly uh, in terms of what is El Nino and why are we also bringing that into today's conversations? Well, it's uh, sort of this weather front that lasts for about nine to 12 months. Uh, it's temporary and natural, but it triggers extreme weather patterns around the globe. And it could be the what we're seeing at the moment in terms of extreme cold, extreme heat, um, wildfires, excessive storms, but which is then um, resulting from the warming of the ocean surface temperatures. And when we move into our conversation about thinking about the impact on children, it's really to look at how these extreme events are going to impact globally, but then of course, specifically for us in South Africa and in Southern Africa, where we again may be looking at drought uh, scenarios. I thought this um, diagram where they've highlighted what are some of the health related risks in relationship to El Nino really can be expanded to when you think of the whole global warming climate collapse uh, concept. And it's looking at these extreme weather events, so floods and droughts and storms and wildfires, as I mentioned, and the various different impacts uh, that they have. So on food security, in terms of agriculture, on communicable diseases, on infectious diseases, vector-borne diseases, uh, fatalities. And I'm going to bring up some more nuanced uh, health effects as I carry on with the, the discussion. And I think what's coming more and more to the fore is the sort of mental health impacts and the impact on well-being of, of children. So when we think about uh, the impact that this global warming is going to have or is having on children, it's important to think about it in terms of the different um, life stages of the child. And I particularly like this diagram because it, focuses you on the life stages and the vulnerability of children. So before the child is born and at the different stages and the triggers, so the different environmental health factors that might um, impact specific health at different time periods, but then how there are these uh, contextual factors. So climate change being one of them and poverty and urbanization and globalization and how climate change is um, an amplifier often of the risks that many children and particularly many children in South Africa are already exposed to. And this is just another uh, diagram to show uh, as the temperature is increasing, the, the sort of uh, severity of the impact that it's going to have on uh, the children, on children, on youth, and how um, more and more hostile the environment is going to to become and um there we go <laughs> my computer's not cooperating uh and this is quite a sort of complex um diagram but what's the takeaway message from it is that really um we're kind of at a tipping point where uh you know, there's been talk about um, at the uh, climate conferences about the 1.5 degree warming, and that if we continue to increase on that trajectory, the um, negative impact it's going to have. But then there's also these windows of opportunity. And how do we, as in our different sectors, in our different roles that we play, uh, harness these opportunities to try and move us a bit more away from the tipping point. And hopefully some of the conversation that we will have today uh, will give you some of those ideas. So there's been a, um, UNICEF has done a document on looking at the risk index for children. And I'm just gonna share very quickly some of these uh, diagrams that they've come up with. And I would encourage you to look at the document. So the um, climate change risk index for children. And if you look obviously specifically for us for uh, in Southern Africa and South Africa, 
you know, what are the environmental shocks and the stresses that are going to be predominant? And you can see that there's a, we're in a high risk area. Also looking at uh, the aspect of poverty and uh, inequality and how this is going to impact as well uh, and be a, a shock and a stress. And as well as uh, water scarcity, again, you can see uh, within the Southern African region, this high index and the drought frequency. And if you look particularly um, in, in the area of um, Southern Africa. So as I mentioned, the UNICEF has done this, that uh, document that the climate crisis is really a child's right crisis. And looking at these two particular pillars of what are the various shocks and stresses that children are going to be exposed to in relationship to water scarcity, coastal floods, heat waves, uh, air pollution, and soil and water pollution, all impacting on various aspects of nutrition, uh, child health, education, being unable to continue with education, as well as um, uh, hygiene and sanitation, and then the impacts of uh, poverty. And if you look, uh, you can see that at the moment, South Africa is ranked 72 in relation to nations at risk. So it's a, it's a call to us to really take this in seriously uh, and to see what we can do in relation to the risks that our children are being exposed to. In the next couple of diagrams, I want to give a bit more nuanced uh, details of some of the examples of children's exposures and vul vulnerability to climate change impacts. And obviously extreme heat uh, at, with global warming is one of the, the key areas. There's also uh, the insect population is gonna change as we heat uh, up with more um, vector-borne diseases and not only is it the exposure then to the diseases, but it's then also exposure to the measures in order to control these de diseases. So an increase, for example, in the use of chemicals uh, and ch children's and youth's exposure to uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals, for example. Uh, malnutrition, uh, I briefly mentioned that as well. And then uh, uh, air pollution, uh, and increased exposure, I've mentioned now the, the um, chemicals, exposures to allergens, and the mental stress. So the post-traumatic stress disorders linked to extreme weather events, uh, as well as the disruption then of, as I mentioned, the educational system and also the infrastructure. Uh, there's a fair amount of research that has linked uh, the increase in violence and domestic violence related to increased temperatures uh, as well as injuries. And what has been interesting is this um, aspect of snake bites and that uh, WHO has recently relaunched a prevention strategy to highlight it as a neglected um, non-communicable disease as snakes are moving more into urban areas as the climate is uh, changing. And if we look at some of the indirect um, health effects associated with the changing climate and global warming, uh, increased water scarcity. So for example, um, as you saw on the, the diagrams, you know, so the Southern Africa is moving more toward drying, um, rising sea levels. So um, impacting the health uh, associated with people living closer to the sea, uh, water related diseases, reduced access to water and sanitation, I uh, mentioned this reduced um, access to schools and healthcare facilities, and also the exacerbation then of uh, increased inequities. One of the things I wanted to raise is the lack of research in South Africa. There is some research, quite a lot um, around heat, uh, but there's a there is a need for a lot more research in relationship to the impacts that um, global warming will have on children. And we conducted this um, systematic review. Uh, so there's quite a lot of studies that are indicating globally that there's an impact of extreme weather events 
on uh, the different aspects of children's lives and vulnerabilities. We conducted the systematic review to see what were the factors in relationship to children living in sub-Saharan Af Africa. And we found two studies that were relevant. And it doesn't mean at all that there are no impacts. What it means is that there's a lack of funding and um, research focus on extreme weather events, impacts on youth and children within Southern Africa. I mentioned already that one of the areas that is up and coming is this looking at climate anxiety. Uh, and there's a lot more studies that are being conducted in high income countries around looking at youths in the there's sort of outlook of the changing climate and how it impacts on on their approach in their current approach to life as well as their future trajectory uh, so i have a student at the moment who's looking at assessing climate anxiety among uh, young people living in rural and urban areas in South Africa, although the research is not yet available, but it's uh, very important that we start documenting, at once documenting, how do we then in input these results into uh, policy. I just wanted to give a few examples of climate-related threats for South African children, and this is by no way, uh, no means an exhaustive list, but uh, I've touched quite a lot on, and I'll highlight again, the aspect of uh, increasing temperatures and how the impact of heat stress and stroke. 20% or more than 20% of children are already stunted in South Africa, and that access to unsafe and limited water, uh, as well as poor soils, poor agricultural production, poor quality food will increase uh, malnutrition. Uh, also that South Africa is a significant contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. And we you know, often think about the greenhouse gas emissions coming from the fossil fuel industry, but we also uh, have quite a lot of agricultural production and the impact that that is having on um, the, the sort of um, greenhouse gas emissions and how the these emissions uh, increase air pollution and the impact that this has then on premature birth or asthma or child cancers or the risk of chronic diseases later in life. And some 80% of young people say that they've been directly affected by climate change in South Africa. This was a, a study done in 2021. The question that I sort of asked is, you know, which children were interviewed? Was it mostly in rural or urban areas? Uh, but you can see the more nuance that 20% that said that, you know, it was from their home being damaged or education being disrupted or limited access to uh, safe water. I quite like this quote from Christine uh, Mohingana from UNICEF, where she says, climate change is likely to deepen the vulnerability of children in South Africa. If we invest now, we can make the services children need to survive and thrive, such as water, healthcare, and education more resilient. And I think it's, it's quite apt that our panel has building on what the previous panel was looking at is the commercial determinants of health and that we do need to look at an individual level. We need to look at an infrastructural level to see how we can actually um, improve the resilience and protect children. But we also need to look and keep stepping back in terms of what are the, the actual commercial impacts. I hope you can see the detail of this diagram uh, where it's showing the different opportunities for intervention and highlighting really the the different aspects uh, of society and life that is impacted by climate change, but then is also impacting on children and where the opportunities lie. I think what's important uh, to remember is that we don't want to get lost in the kind of multi-sectoral aspect to climate change uh, and, and that nobody takes responsibility but also to look at the, the uh, multitude of sectors and areas that are impacted and also can play a role in terms of policymakers or housing, for example, with the, uh, as the temperatures increase, you know, are the, the houses constructed in a way that reduce heat 
uh, schools are schools built in a way that can withstand extreme weather events? Um, are we planning our urban areas so that they don't become heat zones? Uh, is our agricultural action production going to be uh, increasing the use of pesticides because of volatilization and vaporization of the chemicals and the change of the vectors, uh, for example. Just to give you a brief sort of indication that there are various strategies, uh, bills and policies that exist in South Africa, but that very few of them are child-centered and actually put children at the center of the policy will impact them now as well as in the future. And often children are categorized as part of vulnerable populations with a long shopping list of women and elderly um, and immune compromised, for example. There is a national heat action uh, guidelines, which does give uh, more nuanced details of the impacts on children, as well as some of the prevention measures. Um, however, this is this is a guideline. So what are some of the key uh, intervention areas that we should be looking at? So we talk about education, uh, but education goes in different ways. So we talk about education for children to promote their own agency, and we'll be hearing from a young person uh, on how important that is, but also education for adults in terms of what are the risks of children and policymakers. And health professionals, uh, I'm at a medical school uh, trying to get uh, environmental health and climate change within the medical curriculum is very difficult. And for um, medical professionals to see the clinical reference relevance of exposures um, to different environmental factors that is exacerbated by climate change that could be impacting on health in various ways, respiratory, uh, cancers, et cetera. We're trying to increase the, the awareness in, in different sectors. And then looking at advocacy in terms of uh, child-centered pol policies and children's rights and to hear their voices, uh, looking at diagnosing, uh, being able to deal with climate anxiety or infectious diseases or non-communicable diseases, as I said, that are exacerbated by the exposure to climate change. But if you're not aware of what questions to ask uh, or not conducting an environmental history taking, then it's very difficult to do that. And looking at how do we actually report these cases so that they can inform policy as well as the continuing education of health professionals. I mentioned already about the need for more research. And then there's also this aspect of uh, the need for risk communication uh, from government and other sectors. So how do we inform that there's going to be a heat wave? How do we inform the communities and other individuals for the need to be able to um, prepare if there's going to be a storm or wildfires coming? So these are some of the questions that we need to, to ask. So I leave you with um, the, I sort of encourage you to get involved and also to stay informed. And there are different ways you can do this. Uh, the Public Health Association of Southern South Africa has a special interest group on climate, energy and health, which you could join. Uh, the WHO has a global climate change and child health training for healthcare providers. Uh, the link is on the screen. We're gonna hear more about Black Girl Rising activism, which you can also be a part of. and. We'll hear a bit about the Southern African Pediatrics Association's work uh, and Ashraf is, has kindly offered that you can contact him. So I will leave it at that. And there are some uh, points for discussion. So how do we monitor, how do we engage children and how do we make industry more uh, responsible? I hand back to you. Thanks, Marie. Andrea. Thanks for kind of capturing the complexity of this issue, um, the many ways in which it impacts on children, and then opening up some of the, the potential strategies for engagement moving forward. Um, what I would like to do is to ask the other two panellists to turn on their cameras. 
Um, so a very warm welcome to Yola Mkhawana, um, who is um, a young activist from the African Climate Alliance. Um, and I was just wondering if you could turn on your sound and your video and perhaps sort of tell us how is climate change already affecting you and, and other children in Kailicha? Uh, Yola, good to have you here. Very, very warm welcome. Um, yeah, you're way ahead of us on the curve, so we're we're looking forward to to listening and learning from you. Welcome. Oh, hi everyone. Thank you for welcoming me in the space. And as you introduce me, my name is Yola Mkogwana. Ah, I, I'm so sorry. <laughs> that's fine. Too much that's to fine. Yeah. <laughs> Thank My name you. is Yolam Gogwana and I am a young climate activist. I live in Kaili Cham. And how has climate change been affecting me and kids in my community? Um, so it has been affecting us by experiencing um, water cottages. Um, such as like um, grants, we would like go for weeks without any access to water. And I believe that is like all cause of the climate change crisis. Yeah. And you, you, part of that would you would have experienced day zero in, in Cape Town, is that right? Yes, in 2019, yeah, we experienced day zero. It was a time where we had no clean green water. It was a very really difficult time um, for us because we had to, you know, be in the crisis where we had to choose between two basic human rights, which is buying water and buying food. And where we live I mean, much in other communities, our parents don't have jobs to provide and being able to buy all those things. And now when, like during that time, it was like a very difficult time because we had to choose in between being able to buy water or buying food. And it was like a rough time. Yeah, and I can remember also the stress of that time. There, mm -hmm. there was a worry of, is it how is it going to end? Um, how, how how did you know has has climate change also impacted you, you know, on in terms of mental health? I know a lot of young people talk about their fears and their concerns about the future. Um yes, because imagine having to be skipping school and going talking to people on how to act right and do right by um the environment. It is stressing and kind of making us anxious because we are very worried about our future, about our planet, because climate change is, is, more, is, is going to get more worse. And we are going to be the ones, the young ones, our youth that are going to be affected more. And that's why I feel like we are the ones like that are like, concerned and anxious about and striving for change. So, yeah. And, and frustrated at all? I mean, it, it, it sort of feels like young people are driving a lot of this. Um, and, you know, for me, the question is, where you know, where is the leadership? Where, where is government? Um, where are the medical schools? We've already sort of heard that question being raised. Is that also part of the, the, the stress? I didn't hear that. Can you please repeat? Um, I was wondering whether part of the stress that young people are carrying is 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 to do with the failure of sort of adults to lead on this issue and to point us in the right direction. Um, yes, because you know when you want something and like people see it from like a different perspective as you are or maybe let's say they're just turning the blind eye on the issue because they haven't been affected by what you 
say we have been affected by because I feel like when you're talking about something that is going to be happening in the future and also like your lived experience it's like it's a different thing and I feel like for people to be able to act on the issue it's like they have to feel it and forget about that there are people like me children like me who are already living in this world that people say it's going to like they're already experiencing the effects of being climate change that people say it's going to be happening in like more years to come and when we come up front and talking about these things um the decision makers or the government they they delay on hearing our voices and making change so that is like what is frustrating the most mm -hmm. yeah i know i hear you um, I'm going to bring Ashraf into the conversation now. I'm, I'm keen, Ashraf, to know, yeah, what, you know, as, as a, a pediatrician, as head of the Department of Pediatrics at, at WITS, um, yeah, what keeps you up at night in relation to, to climate? What, what made you step up and get involved? Thanks, uh, Laurie. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Well, yeah. quite literally, the heat. <laughs> We're getting, it's getting hotter. Many of you might have noticed that you can't sleep at night when it's too hot. So that's what keeps me awake. But no, figuratively speaking, I think the what worries me a lot about it um, is the fact that it's almost an overwhelming, too big a problem for us to deal with. But there's an urgency to this that we're all kind of missing and we are not, you know, there's too, there's too little conversations, too little plans being discussed now because there's so many other, you know, issues that are more pressing or, you know, supposedly more pressing and more immediate, you know, childhood poverty, you know, infectious diseases, violence, etc. But this is, um, climate change is one of those really sort of silent, almost tsunamis that we are um, kind of aware of, but are not taking any action. So what keeps me awake is the clock ticking um, and what we're not doing. And, you know, when you get to my age, then you think about your kids and your grandkids, and you think, what kind of future are they going to have? And when I think about really the extreme weather events that we've had. And we've, as South Africa, has, have largely been saved from the worst, I think, of the extreme weather events, although we are by no means um, unaffected. We are affected in so many ways, as, as Andrea very nicely put, in terms of it, mostly the indirect effects, I think. But when you think about those, the, the, um, these impacts that we are experiencing when, when it's obvious, and what the IPCC report tells us is that no matter what we do right now, uh, we're going to continue to experience this for a long time to come. Uh, we have to act, but we are going to be experiencing this for a long time to come, and we're going to see more of what we see now. So there's just more of now going to happen. <laughs> and so this is what keeps me awake. Uh, I think for me, I'm also worried at uh, how fragile our systems are um, and how ill-prepared they are to cope with additional shocks and 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 strain. You know, whether that's the floods, whether it's extreme heat, um, or something like Day Zero, which we've seen play out not only in Cape Town but across uh, across the Eastern Cape. So I think this issue is is touching all of us um but i think you're also right that we have a tendency to you know to because it feels so big so overwhelming we we want to bury our heads in the sand um yeah it's a very frightening thing to look forward into that kind of future and i think the other thing perhaps where we do ourselves a disservice is we we, we talk about climate change happening sometime in the future it you know it's a problem for our children or our children's children but actually you and I are already living in a world that is heating up and you and I are going to be bare, you know, we're, we're going to be feeling the brunt of this. Um, it, it's our problem. It's not something that can, you know, like a can that can be kicked down the road for another generation to, to, to pick up. So I'm very excited that we're having this, this conversation. Um, I want to bring Andrea back into the room just to give us a sense of what, yeah, what, 
yeah, what worries you? What's what's motivating you to tackle this issue of of climate change? Uh, thanks. Well, it's you know it's interesting because again, building on the previous conversation of commercial determinants of health, um, it, it's this, you know we've known about that there's been a climate collapse. We know there's been global warming for, for over 30 years. And yet often the conversation feels like it's still new for people. And this aspect of, um, you know, that people are now seeing evidence of climate change. And so one has to step back and kind of ask the question, well, why, why, why has it, is it taking so long for people to actually engage with it at the different sectoral levels and to engage and realize that it is having an impact uh, on current generations as well as future generations? And I think it's, uh, I go back then and how important it is for us to take into account that there's, you know, in the previous conversation, um, uh, Mark mentioned the playbook by the industry, and it's the same playbook that's being used about climate denialism. Uh, and I mean, I was actually asked by someone the other day, do I really believe in this climate change um, thing that's happening? And I think if we really want to protect our children from the various aspects, um, I, I'm sort of half through answering the question that someone posed in the chat about air pollution, climate change, and the risks uh, to children. And, and the shopping list is long, you know, the respiratory effects, the, the asthma, uh, the, the cancers, and we're seeing an increase in a lot of these health effects now uh, with our children. And, and so I think what keeps me awake is why are we spending so much time trying to show that climate change is having an impact rather than actually moving forward and trying to target at the different levels of where it actually um, is impacting, both from the industry, but also, as I said, the lack of infrastructure and as we've heard the impact on, on children. So, so that really, um, yeah, that keeps me awake at night. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so taking it back to Yola, um, I mean, Andrea's reminded us of this sort of sense of urgency. Um, I think Ashraf talked about um, climate change being a bit like a tsunami. So in a sense, the, the tide has pulled out and we're waiting for this enormous wave to to overwhelm us in some some ways. What is it that we can do? Because I think one of the reasons why we we look the other way or we feel paralyzed by climate change is because it seems so big. Um, so what are some of the practical things that we could be doing in our homes and, and communities? Um, and what is it that you are doing in, in Kailicha? Okay, so can I first start with what I do, then to what you guys can do? Okay, so what I do in my community, I have an environmental club called the Green Environment. And um, I work with kids between the ages of nine to 11 years old. And in my club, we, I teach them the information and the knowledge I got from um, my extramural classes um, on climate change and also on how to keep in our environment clean. So it's not um, the big words for the kids. It's majorly on how to be able to keep um, the environment clean and finding ways and being nice to the environment. And by doing the small changes, which I believe um, following the three R's, which is recycling, reusing, and all that. So um, the work that we had been doing, so usually on Fridays, we go around our community, um, picking litter and doing eco breaks. Um, which is that like that's a, like a way more creative way of us being able to keep to clean our community and keeping it clean um, and also being creative with our own hands. So that's what we have been doing, and we they also like have um, the container gardens in their homes where they're able to plant and have their own food because living in marginalized communities like there's a lot of struggles and a lot of inequalities and due to the to the price inflation so they are able to harvest from their gardens and 
provide for their families. It's like it's the creative way of coming up with um, awareness in my community. And what I believe that people should do, um, all the people, um, I believe that like there are many ways that can be done for young children's voices to be heard in the climate conversations, um, like creating spaces for children to participate in decision-making um, through child-friendly um, consultations and by including their perspectives in policy making and as well as opportunities for children to learn about the climate and about the environment. Because I believe that we as kids, we learn um, through being educated, you know, and especially for kids when learning, like you have to be creative, like learn, make them learn through um, fun activities and all. And so, yeah. That sounds really, really powerful. Um, yeah, the sort of sense of agency, the sense of purpose, um, the creativity that you've spoken about, but also the sense that you're, you're, you're creating these gardens um, that are partly about caring for your environment, but are also putting food on the table. Um, and that's part of building, in my view, that's part of building resilient communities um, and building, mm -hmm. well, and a building community, building relationships. Um, and I think that's going to be one of the really important um, safety nets, really, mm -hmm. for us moving forward is, is connecting with one another, caring for one another, um, and caring for our immediate environment. So it just it just feels like you've got like all these incredibly powerful seeds for for kind of sowing a, a, a better future here and and today. Um, I'm going to ask Ashraf if you think about your role as a clinician. You know, what what is it that we can do? Um, as doctors, as nurses, as pediatricians within the health service what are the kind of practical things that we could do to step up and address this challenge yeah thanks laurie i mean i guess there's there's a lot that one can do but i mean like with everything one has to work closely in teams and in organizations to to have an impact and you can try at a personal level to do things and i think all of us individually uh, need to do things at an individual level, but we're talking about how to actually mobilize um, others within the healthcare sector. And I think, I think at the first stage, it's to be able to find ways to um, activate activism and make people understand just how what what we're dealing with, what do we mean by climate change. So it's some of the most basic um, educational and awareness messages that we need to somehow kind of curate or, or develop that helps people see this as something that they would like to prioritize and that they would like to join in. So it's, it's I think, you know, as a clinician, we've got on the one hand, a role to, to um, deal with patients who might be affected by climate change and begin to understand that. So to educate ourselves as to what are the things that we're likely or that we're already seeing and that we're likely to be seeing more of as a result of climate change and what so what are the clinical impacts at an individual and population level. And then knowing that there's there's we need to arm ourselves with how do we then begin to provide families and the population with anticipatory kind of guidance around, well, what do you do? So if, if I give you a very practical example, mm -hmm. heat, right? We, we're going to have more and more sort of extreme, um, you know, uh, heat uh, waves, and they are going to be, there's going to be effects from that. So how do we arm ourselves in terms of, first of all, picking that up, anticipating it, what the problems are going to be, and how do we tell parents as pediatricians how, how do you prepare yourself for that? How do you protect yourself from these sort of things? And then a second role, sorry, Laurie, was that a lot of us as clinicians, as particularly in the public sector, have a, another role, and that is training our, our junior staff. Our, you know, So whether it's interns, medical officers, undergraduate medical students, we're all steeped in that. 
And how do we actually include that in our curriculum? I think somebody, Andrea, I think brought that up. How do we bring that up into education? And that's a that's important. That's something that I think we all have to do in smart ways quickly. Thank you. Um, and then handing over to uh, Andrea, you've you've talked about two other potential strategies or three other potential strategies for engagement. Um, one was around the higher education curriculum. Um, the second was around the commercial determinants of health. You know, do clinicians um, and public health specialists have a role in 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 challenging the fossil fuel industry or um, big agriculture? Um, and then where do we or what do we do to ensure that children are really placed at the center of laws and policies um, that will guide our national response to the climate crisis? Thanks. <laughs> Three big questions. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I I think starting perhaps, you know, with the, the so the WHO talks about this health and all policies. And, and I've always said that we need to rephrase that to children's health and all policies. And, and if we look through the lens of children that are vulnerable, they are still developing their, you know, they're breathing in more air, the air is polluted, uh, they're on the ground, they're being exposed to uh, exhaust and dust, for example. And yet our policies are always targeted at a, a sort of a general human. It's often a, a, an adult male. And a lot of our, what we, our risk assessments that we do, for example, are based on, you know, healthy males. We need to change our mindset in terms of our policies and think about children and really focus on, on them and their vulnerabilities. And I think we would then impact a broader sector of society uh, as well. And it's quite hard uh, to look at, especially in South Africa with all the challenges and inequalities we have, look at um, addressing children now, but also preparing for the future. And I think we, we can't underestimate the, what's impacting on children uh, and the youth, uh, as Yola has, has said, both positive and negative. I mean, the amount of youth I've heard say who don't want to have children, they don't want to bring children into this environment. So how do we create policies that ensure children and the youth that actually their future is being taken into account. Uh, so that's one one thing is to really have child, when we talk about these child-centered um, uh, policies. And I think we need to ask ourselves, you know, we're seeing a lot of health effects that are actually attributed to or exacerbated by climate change. And what are we doing about that? You know, the, the respiratory effects, the asthmas, the, um, allergies that are increasing, the more and more cancers, and and to really looking at what's happening around in the environment and the impact on that. I mean, we talk about climate change as kind of a catch-all, but the, it's nuanced. It's got components to it that are very important in terms of both the indirect and the, the direct effects. Um, I can't remember your second element <laughs> you you talked higher about higher education higher education yes. um well i think I, I mean i really do think that uh, it's getting buy in um from health professionals and and not just medical uh doctors but also those who are in allied uh, health fields, whether, you know, it's occupational health or uh, audiology or um, physiotherapy, all of the, all of those disciplines are having patients come to them that are experiencing health impacts uh, that have been exacerbated by climate change. But if we're not teaching uh, around this, if we're not bringing it into the clinical um, domain where we're actually uh, showing young medical professionals or health professionals how to identify these what are the questions that you ask you know where where do people when we think about heat exposure you know 
where do people spend their time during the day? Where are children spending the time during the day? And what are the measures that are being taken into account? So I think equipping our health professionals both to identify what are the risks and what are the prevent preventative measures. Um, that, so identifying the risk, but also being a party to um, educating the broader community on how to prevent, uh, you know, these various aspects and, and exposures. And I've forgotten your third one. I want Sorry, to dive in and respond. Sorry. Respond. I think. I think. Yeah. I was just struck by one of the things you said about the need to really make this concrete. Um, I was really struck by a presentation I listened to earlier this year that talked about the impact of extreme heat on infants that have been swaddled. And they, mothers swaddle their children and wrap them up in a blanket to, to protect them, to keep them held and safe. Um, but in extreme heat, um, the heat can be so extreme that the the baby's skin starts to peel off. Now, that is a, a very graphic, shocking image um, that I hadn't anticipated. I hadn't imagined that that you know heat could do something that dramatic to to a child. Um, but now that I've heard that, it's made me think, well, what else do we need to be worried about? Um, another example would be um, understanding that the, the heat inside a tin shack can be, the temperature can be 10 degrees higher than the ambient air temperature outside. So what does that mean for, you know, children who are kept inside to keep them safe over a school holiday? Um, how do we give anticipatory guidance around that? What does it mean for children in ECD centers when those are converted containers, which are, you know, essentially hot boxes with very little ventilation. And and so there's, for me, these questions, when we start to ground them in, you know, in very concrete practical terms, they they, they really call to us as, as, as a health community to step up um, and engage um, and, and work very much in, in partnership with communities. Um, a lot of the stories that have come out of the states with the extreme heat that we saw earlier this year was the need to to mobilize communities to look out for um, members of the community who may be vulnerable, for example, the elderly um, who may struggle with walking far in the heat. Um, so how can we go and do the shopping for them or look out for them in different ways? Um, and the same would apply to the very young um, who, who are extremely vulnerable. So it really, for me, call, it, we, it's calling for a whole of society approach. Um, but as a health community, we need to be joining the dots um, and making the linkages between what's happening with climate change and what that means for the health of, of our children. Um, so I wanted to come back to your lab. Um, I'm very mindful that um, there's sort of two things that are happening. Um, at the moment, there's the, the meeting of global leaders at COP28, um, and that's really going to try and set an agenda um, for us moving forward. And then early next year, of course, we've got elections happening in, in South Africa. So I just wanted to know what would be your call to leaders in government and leaders who are attending COP28? What, what is it that you would be asking for um, in terms of climate change and child health? Yola, your, your thoughts. Oh, okay. Is for them to hear us and paying attention to what we're saying and hearing our complaints and making them into action rather than saying they acknowledge and also they hear us, but also to act on what we're saying. And I want to see changes and I want to see um, more knowledge on climate change being spread out. And I want to see like um, people 
um, acting. Yeah, in keeping the environment safe and clean for everyone to be in. And also help um, spread the word and for climate action. Thank you. Thank you for calling us out and calling us to, to action. Um, Ash, some last thoughts from your side around an agenda. I mean, I think the the other thing I wanted to say was that a big role we have apart from, you know, um, impacting on parents and directly with our patients is our advocacy role. So just as much as we are affected by it, we can affect it, we can affect change by speaking out as advocates for children and advocates for health in general. So I'm not I'm not sure I'm allowed to say this, Laurie, but that there will be a statement coming out on climate change. Dave, I know Dave is on the call as well, and I won't say more, but I think that's an exciting start that once there's a, a statement from us as a community of pediatric providers that says, this is what we're calling for, then we can rally around that message and we can each find it, you know, we can each find a bit of the action items that are called for on this statement that we can try and uh, work towards implementing. I hope I'm okay I, by saying that, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. I think it's 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 a, a a call to action that has emerged out of a a small working group who have been meeting since much earlier this year. There was a, a conference um, focusing on child health and community and climate change in Africa. Um, that took place, I think, in April. And that's, that's kick-started the beginnings of a conversation. And we would really, really like to have as many of you on the call um, to join us in, in thinking through how we take this forward as a, a child health community. Um, and I think everyone on the conference will have received the call to action. And, and we could also share this. Perhaps Dave can share it in the chat for those who haven't seen it yet. Um, Andrea, what would be your call to action um, for the leaders who are meeting in in, in uh, Saudi Arabia at the moment? Well, I, I, I mean, I think one really can't underestimate the role of the industry. And, and I think for me, that's probably the one of the key issues is is holding the industry more responsible and when we talk about industry people generally been you know looking at fossil fuels but as i mentioned the agrochemical industry is also contributing a lot so so that would be one but the other as you know as you were giving your example Laurie, about the heat and you know the swaddling of children and and what the other sort of call to action is if you look at the adaptation strategies or the prevention measures or the yeah the the adaptation measures they're coming from high income countries so for example how do we deal with the heat again and again you hear people saying we'll go into air conditioning and and that is an absolutely unrealistic solution and so one of my calls would be that you know we start looking for uh, adaptation strategies that are realistic, that are cost effective, that we can afford, that work within informal settlements. Um, you know, painting the structures white, for example. Um, but if cool zones is going to be recommended, how can we create a cool zone that doesn't uh, include air conditioning, which is unrealistic? So those would be my two elements, is looking at the top in terms of industry's impact and really holding industry accountable, but also looking for adaptation strategies that are realistic and cost-effective for low and middle-income countries. Thanks, thanks, Andrea. I'm just mindful also, perhaps with a final word, just um, to reflect on a movie I watched last night um, about climate activists on the wild coast um, who have fought um, and so far succeeded in preventing shell from exploring and exploiting oil and gas reserves off the coast. And they have used arguments that are rooted in their relationship with the land, um, their spiritual connection to the sea. Um, and it's a uniquely African response. It's, it's, it's rooted 
um, in our continent. And I think we've got so much to learn um, and to appreciate um, in terms of a more um, resilient and sustainable relationship with the earth. Um, and, and, and part of what we're needing to do is to let go of this headlong pursuit for faster and faster cars, bigger and bigger aeroplanes um, that are part of the seduction um, that comes with oil and gas. So I wanted to thank you all um, for joining us um, for this session. I would like to encourage everybody to read through the call to action, um, which is a call to really center children and child health um, and climate change um, in our work as an association. And yeah, really we're looking forward to working with you on that agenda moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant, great. Thanks, Larry and the panelists. Um, absolutely amazing and inspirational. And uh, looking forward to taking this taking this further. That it's not just two hours on a Tuesday afternoon, but that this actually be, get, gets sustained and carried on, and um, and that we can build momentum from here. Um, so very inspirational. Um, just and a finally, in... sorry, just a, just and a, just particularly a, a a huge shout out and thanks to Yola for for joining us um, mm. and really putting children at the centre of the conversation.